taking for my time. Um, before I say anything, uh, I, I do want to give um, a, a plug for a new film that is out called Roadmap to Apartheid. If it is possible to watch this movie and not come away with number one, Israel is an apartheid state, and number two, the only conceivable solution is a binational one uh, of genuine dem democracy, then you're brain dead, you're soulless, and just give it up. Um, wherever we can get this film, um, this film should be shown, and, and by some Curious fluke of uh, coincidence, I'm sure. Um, its, its recent premiere in New York City, both showings were somehow followed, I'm, I'm sure it's a coincidence, by the Institute, uh, the Israeli Institute for Cultural Affairs, showing a, a film countering that narrative. Um, but um, uh, yes, they, I, I think we should be quite proud, frankly, in New York City that the state of Israel has now set up a branch um, that it finances to the tune of $6 million um, to counter the likes of us. I think our coffers have $1.98. So <laughs> that in and of itself is a, is a sort of success. Um, but I, I do want to talk about um, Israeli apartheid and get into a few key questions. The first um, thing to say, of course, is that everyone in this room knows at least one word of Afrikaans, the Germanic language um, brought to Southern Africa, to South Africa, to Namibia, to what was then known as Rhodesia, then now Zimbabwe, uh, the Dutch settlers from the 17th century, and that word, of course, is apartheid. The word apartheid is, uh, basically means apartness or separateness, um, and in 1948, Again, great uh, curiosity, the same year that Israel was established as a state, apartheid became the official policy of the white South African government, referring to the laws, the policies, and the practices uh, established by the South African government to maintain the supremacy, of course, as we all know, of the white minority over the non-white majority, which lasted, of course, until 1994. Uh, in 1973, the United Nations uh, General Assembly adopted what is known as the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, defining apartheid as a crime against humanity that is not and was not seen, even at that time, as specific to the state of South Africa. Um, now, as a socialist, I don't particularly revere um, the United Nations um, the way many liberals do. We socialists understand the United Nations not to be this wonderful sort of kumbaya internationalist gathering of the greatest minds and hearts with all of our interests at heart. Um, in fact, of course, it is representatives of the ruling classes of the world who come together and um, screw us over. Um, but internationally, with blue helmets, um, which feels very different, very different. It's very different from green. Blue and green are not the same, um, though they are similar on the spectrum. Um, but I think it's important to cite UN resolutions if only, and perhaps if only, um, because they carry a certain moral authority, if nothing else. And it is worth citing the resolutions because it exposes the hypocrisy and the criminality of the member states that, of course, shockingly enough, say one thing and do another. <laughs> Um, now, the crime of apartheid is, um, my voice just changed, I think I just went to purity. Um, the, the, the crime of apartheid is defined by inhuman acts, in, in the words of the UN, committed with the purpose of imposing racial segregation and discrimination on a targeted group and establishing domination of one group over another. The convention specifically prohibits acts, in their words, designed to divide the population by the creation of separate reserves and ghettos for the members of of a racial group or groups, the prohibition of mixed marriages, the expropriation of landed property, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes on to prohibit measures that deprive people and organizations of their basic human rights, including the right to go to work, the right to an education, the right to leave and return to their country, the right to a nationality, the right to freedom of movement and residence. Um, and I would say this pretty much exactly describes 
the state of Israel, its legal character, its political character to a T. Um, all of these rights are denied Palestinians, and, and we Americans are somewhat familiar with this concept, um, uh, having lived in a country which from the late 19th century until the 1960s had a sort of form of apartheid ourselves, of Jim Crow um, segregation. There can be no doubt about it. There is no um, question about it, certainly from the vantage point, um, not only of socialists, but people with souls, um, that uh, and eyes to see uh, and ability to critically examine the facts before you and draw objective conclusions that Israel is an apartheid state. Um, we don't have to applaud that sort of thing, it's just fact. Um, once and only once in the history of that august body on 42nd Street by the river, once and only once did the United Nations ever revoke one of its resolutions, and it may not shock you to know, it was the resolution that was passed in 1975 um, by an overwhelming vote um, calling and referring to Israel as an apartheid state. It determined that Zionism, I should say, is a form of racism and racial discrimination. That is actually what the resolution said. And lo and behold, come 1991, that resolution, and only that resolution, was revoked. Such was the pressure of the US government and Israel and um, um, whatever other puppet governments they could find um, to do their bidding for them. Now let's talk first. There's really essentially three things I want to cover here. One, in what ways is Israel actually an apartheid state? We should establish those facts. We should absorb those facts. We should know those. Um, we do understand, as people who are confronting a rather well-financed um, propaganda campaign from the Israeli state and from many of the people um, who uh, act on their behalf, that we need to know this sort of thing in order to counter it. We want to understand as well, in what ways is it different from South African apartheid? And then I actually want to spend some time actually talking about why, in God's name, is this practice continued, the only apartheid state continue well into the 21st century? Why the hatred, why the level of dehumanization, dispossession, and occupation of the Palestinian people after all these years, 64 years? What exactly accounts for this um, kind of madness? Um, well, first of all, in 1948, um, Israel, as many of us know, was founded as a Jewish state, which we will come back to in a moment. There is a, a slight problem with calling a state both Jewish and democratic, um, and, uh, and, and on land that was ethnically cleansed of its indigenous Palestinian population. At least 800,000 Palestinians were driven from their homes through murder and terror um, by Israeli guerrilla forces, and this central fact of ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in, uh, as basically Israel's birth pangs 64 years ago um, is called by Zionists the War of Independence, Hagar HaAtzma'ut. Um, it's an interesting form of independence. Um, Hagar HaAtzma'ut, but among the Arab population, among the Palestinians, is known, uh, I believe, from our vantage point, far more appropriately as the Nakba, uh, the catastrophe. Um, just a, a year ago, Israel's Congress, known as the Knesset, passed what is known as the Nakba law, which among other things makes it illegal, illegal for Israeli public schools and institutions to teach the genuine history that Israel was born through terror and racism. You are not allowed to teach or refer to the Nakba in, in Israeli schools. If you can only imagine um, if in this country it were illegal to teach about slavery, now, they don't teach about slavery, by and large. Um, uh, I, I grew up in the 1970s, and the reason why I feel somewhat versed throughout slavery, aside from having become a revolutionary in red, is because of, thank God, Alex Haley and Roots um, uh, brought slavery into the consciousness of a generation of Americans um, who sat there fixated for eight days in a row, four hours a night, um, I don't even think with commercials, um, staring at a screen and learning our history. Um, if you haven't seen it, by the way, that's a brilliant TV show. Sit yourself down and watch Roots. Um, but if you can imagine that the state denies the right to teach its history, you begin only to get the first, the first whiff, the, the, the first taste of the filth that lies at the heart of Israeli society. Um, as a result of the Nakba, most Palestinians became refugees and to this day are not allowed by Israel to return to their lands despite despite the internationally recognized right to return as once again guaranteed by um, that somewhat toothless operation, the United Nations. Um, uh, and today, of the 11.2 million Palestinians in the world, 
69% live outside of Israel, Palestine, largely as refugees, many of them living in camps in Jordan, in Lebanon, and of course dispersed throughout the world. Racial discrimination against the indigenous Palestinian people was formalized and institutionalized through the creation of a Jewish nationality, which actually in Israel is quite distinct from Israeli citizenship. No Israeli nationality actually exists. There is no such thing um, in Israel. And the Supreme Court has persistently refused to recognize such a thing as it would actually end the system, um, at least formally speaking, of Jewish supremacy in the state of Israel. The 1950 Law of Return entitles all Jews and only Jews to the rights of nationals, namely the right to enter the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, which would be Israel and the occupied territories, and immediately enjoy full legal and political rights. Jewish nationality under the law of return is extraterritorial, which is to say that not just the Jews living in Israel, but even any Jews here or anywhere else in the world are considered to be um, part of that Jewish nation. Um, and excludes, by definition, all non-Jews, which is to say certainly all Palestinians, from nationality rights in Israel. Point blank, period, end of sentence. Wrap your head around what that means. I am Jewish and I was born in Brooklyn. My parents are Jewish, they were born in Brooklyn. In fact, my grandparents, also Jewish, they were born in Brooklyn. Which means that for three generations of wandering Jews, my family comes from a swath of very sedentary Jews. But the three generations of Jews born in Brooklyn have an immediate right not only to citizenship, but full nationality with full equal rights in the state of Israel, whereas Palestinians whose families have been there for generation after generation have none of those rights. That is, lies right at the core of the inequality and the apartheid nature of the state of Israel. The 1952 citizenship law has created a discriminatory two-tier system, legal system, whereby Jews hold nationality and citizenship, while the remaining indigenous Palestinian citizens hold only citizen citizenship. And under Israeli law, the status of Jewish nationality is accompanied with a, with a host of full uh, first class rights and benefits which are not granted to Palestinian citizens who make up not a small amount, actually much more um, than the percentage of blacks uh, in this country, more than 20% of uh, Israel proper, which is to say not the West Bank, not Gaza Strip, but uh, inside uh, the rest of Israel um, is, uh, is, is Palestinian. Um, and in terms of the sort of um, apartheid dynamic, again, I think it's important you not take my word for it, who the hell am I, uh, just some red, um, but let's hear what Jewish Israelis themselves say about the state. And here we're not talking about, again, random leftists or radicals or people who are particularly um, in dissent, but people with positions of power in the state of Israel and presumably uh, somewhat respected by the powers that be. Here is how Roman Bronfman, a member of Israel's Yahad party, um, uh, described the country that he is uh, a legislator in uh, in 2005. He said, uh, he referred to Israel as an apartheid regime. He referred to an apartheid regime in the occupied territories, West Bank and Gaza, and went on to say the policy of apartheid, right, a word that we're not supposed to use in the New York Times, a word that we're not supposed to use because it's supposedly anti-Semitic to actually reference this in any way. This is a legislator in Israel saying the policy of apartheid has also infiltrated sovereign Israel and discriminates daily against Israeli Arabs and other minorities. The struggle against such a fascist viewpoint, his word, not mine, is the job of every humanist. Um, here is the former Knesset speaker, Reuven Rivlin, openly discussing, in his words, quote, the racism and arrogance from Israeli Jews and the inequality in the allocation of state funds. And then I move on to say something about the Jewish South African leaders who know a thing or two about apartheid, uh, the most prominent of whom is a fellow by the name of Ronnie Kasrils, um, have issued a statement called Not In Our Names Declaration of Conscience, and it reads like this. It becomes difficult, particularly from a South African perspective, 
not to draw parallels with the oppression experienced by Palestinians under the hand of Israel and the oppression experienced in South Africa under apartheid rule. And Ronnie Casrells, Casrells, I'm sorry, I don't know the pronunciation of his name, um, recently described um, the, um, in his travels to Palestine his observations in comparing Israel to apartheid South Africa. He wrote, traveling into Palestine's West Bank and Gaza Strip, which I visited recently, is like a surreal trip back into an apartheid state of emergency in South Africa. It is shocking to discover that certain roads are barred to Palestinians and reserved for Jewish settlers. I try in vain to recall anything quite as obscene in apartheid South Africa. And that can be said time after time of, 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 of black South Africans, uh, colored South Africans, white South Africans uh, describing when they go to Palestine, when they go to Israel, that they actually are witnessing things that they could not have imagined even existing under the conditions of apartheid South Africa. In every area of life, land allocation, health, education, marriage, travel, employment, housing. To say that Palestinians are discriminated against, in my opinion, is a little banal. I think it is more appropriate to say that Palestinians are brutalized, they are denied basic human rights, and written about and conceived of as a subhuman species by the state of Israel and its institutions. That is the state of Israel. Israel is an apartheid state. I want to um, move on to talk about some of these categories and then go on to the rest of the, the conversation about why all of this, what's driving all of this. The Israeli status law of 1952 authorizes the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish Agency, and um, that outfit that we are maybe familiar with on uh, certain cosmopolitan centers with large Jewish communities. You will see little blue boxes with the Star of David collecting funds for the Jewish National Fund. Um, to, and they are in control. They have been given control, these sort of semi-private, semi-state, how do you quite describe this, um, control over most of the land of Israel for the exclusive benefit of Jews. They stated outright, not the state, but the Jewish National Fund states it outright. Um, the state doesn't explicitly claim that Palestinians have no right to the land, but the, by outsourcing control of it to semi-private entities like the JNF, 93% of all land is held for the exclusive use of Jews in the state of Israel. It's worth noting, by the way, that under apartheid in South Africa, 87% of the land was um, devoted to whites only. Not so much better, but nonetheless, um, by way of comparison. Um, abs the, the absentee property law of 1950 classifies the personal property, and this is, a, this is one of those wonderful Orwellian things about the state of Israel. Um, it classifies the personal property of Palestinians who fled during 1948, right, who were terrorized to leave their homes, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, they, that, their property is now known as absentee property, which is, of course, reverted over to state property, now overseen by the JNF, and therefore transferred over to become Jewish property. Um, one quarter of Israeli Palestinians um, who fled their homes in terror in 1948, um, when the terrorist gangs, and those gang leaders, by the way, later went on to run the state of Israel, right? Yitzchak Shamir, Menachem Begin, right? It's kind of a junta um, that runs that sort of theocratic police state. Um, when they were chased out, they are considered, only Orwell would have come up with this, present absentees. Um, actually, it's interesting. I learned from the film the other night, Roadmap to Apartheid, that South Africa had a similar formulation. They referred to blacks um, who were then thrown into these sort of Bantu stands when they came into South Africa proper, you know, their homeland. Um, they were referred to as foreign nationals. Very interesting. Um, so 250,000 or so Palestinians in Israel may be physically re residents of Israel, and yet they are considered present absentees. Um, I don't know how you wrap your head around that contradiction, but, um, but certainly the people who run the state of Israel do. And they basically have absolutely no rights and no claims over their families' lands and property. And, you know, and, and this is, this is, a, this is a, 
essential point that drives so much of the narrative. You, you open up, um, Ali Albunima will be speaking tomorrow with, uh, with Wael and with Michael Letwin and with um, La Mystique, who we're fortunate to have all of them here to talk about the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. <laughs> Ali opens his book um, called One Country about uh, uh, the one state solution, which he'll be speaking on tomorrow as well, um, and describes his family fleeing, his mother's family fleeing their home um, right outside Jerusalem um, in 48. They literally, you know, you know they, they're packing things up and grandpa says, what are you doing? We're coming back. We'll be back in a few days. Don't you worry. Don't take anything. Leave that here. We're going. We'll be back. Of course, they never came back again. And yet you go to Israel. Israel and you talk to Zionists and they proudly show you their homes and say, oh yes, when we moved in, the breakfast table was still set with the breakfast dishes. And they say this proudly. This is how we moved in. Um, every, we didn't have to buy furniture. It was all here. Um, these are the two um, counter narratives that exist that actually both agree and disagree. Um, they, they agree on the facts, but the, the interpretation of the facts is an entirely different story. The, the national planning and building law in 1965 creates a system of discriminatory zoning that basically freezes all existing Arab villages while providing for the expansion of literally hundreds and hundreds of Jewish settlements. Um, the law also reclassifies large numbers of Arab villages as non-residential, which basically means the state of Israel provides no municipal services, no running water, no electricity, no roads, no sewage, nothing, 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 nothing. You're not considered there, you're not supposed to be there. Why you're not supposed to be there? We say you're not supposed to be there, and therefore we will do nothing to service your existence there. That is the thinking and that is the practice of the state of Israel. In 1967, after the war, Israel annexed the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, beginning a military occupation of these areas that continues to this day. And since then, Israeli settlements have been built on expropriated, um, the ongoing expropriation of Palestinian land in that area. Um, and the colonization of the West Bank continues at a rapid pace, has been accelerated by Israel's construction, and we'll talk about this in a moment, of the apartheid wall, um, which it continues to build despite the fact that it flies in the face of uh, international law to do that. Um, since the 67 war, the Israeli government has demolished nearly 20,000 houses belonging to Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, according to the International Committee Against Housing Demolitions. And when Israel to understand what these look like, in fact, there's a very good new book. It's a very useful book in terms of talking about the perversity that is this notion of a Jewish and democratic state. It's by Ben Smith, um, ben, excuse me, Ben White, who writes for Electronic Intifada called Palestinians in Israel. And in it, there are a few descriptions of what it actually feels like, what it looks like when they do a housing demolition. This is not some sort of, you know, um, small affair. First of all, the state of Israel spends somewhere upwards of $150,000 each home that it destroys. It brings in literally hundreds of soldiers. It often happens starting at 4 o'clock in the morning. They show up to your home. Um, the pretext is you have no permit to build here. Of course, even according to Human Rights Watch, you cannot get a, permanent, a permit to build anywhere, a zoning variance for if you are Palestinian. So where are you going to live? You eventually have to have a home. You have to have somewhere to put your things, put your children, put yourself. Um, people build a home. And the Israeli Armed Forces comes in and comes in early in the morning with hundreds of soldiers, surrounds the place, brings in weaponized Caterpillar uh, bulldozers, which is why the campaign against Caterpillar becomes so important. It is directly implicated and directly responsible and completely complicit in the crime of apartheid uh, state. And they come in and often will knock on the door, tell the family to leave, and with the refrigerator in there, and with the books, and with the furniture, and the clothes, and the photographs, and every damn thing that family has, they destroy the whole lot. Because it's not just about imposing the zoning law, it's about dehumanizing and humiliating the people who live there. And then they will stand there and watch as Jewish families are moved into their home or onto that space and rebuild a finer home, a, cos uh, a condo development, or what have you. Um, these demolitions are part of a web of policies designed to force Palestinians off their own land to make room for expanding Israeli settlements and construct um, a 25-foot high apartheid wall that cuts deep into Palestinian lands. And at this point, inside of the West Bank, takes up almost 50% 
of the territory of the West Bank is taken up by these settlements and the wall that now um, uh, goes around it. Now, Israelis refer, and at every talk I've ever given on any campus where they send in one of their paid operatives, which I think is very interesting, they have to pay these people, um, uh, they say, the war, it's, don't call it an apartheid, it's a separation fence. And I thought, a fence? A fence is what my grandma put around the roses to keep the dog out. This is what the fence looks like. It's 25 feet high. When it's fully completed, it will run 450 miles. Um, it has razor wire. It has guard towers um, that house soldiers, of course, carrying high-powered uh, machine guns. And it has checkpoints through which Palestinians must wait hours, sometimes days, to pass through if they are allowed to pass through at all. And this is sometimes because they chopped at the West Bank so mercilessly. It means that sometimes going to school, or certainly going to the hospital, or you know, going to your own land across on the other side of the wall means that you have to go through one of these checkpoints. It is an utter nightmare. And as a result of the wall, the West Bank has been carved into isolated little cantons that are often uh, uh, you know, referred to as Bantu stands, just like the black homelands that were um, fabricated by the white supremacists in South Africa um, were, were created. Um, and, and really, the, the Palestinian faced restricted movement between these Bantu stands, which is enforced through an extensive checkpoint system, as I mentioned. On a regular basis, Palestinians living in the occupied territories experience frequent harassment, arrest, and now, as we are all getting to know, become more familiar with, if you're at all political, um, are hearing about these hunger strikes against administrative detention, in which hundreds and now thousands of Palestinians, hundreds of them who are youths, who are children, are sometimes taken in the middle of the night out of their homes and put in detention for detention. Makes it seem like they're sitting in a corner in a cozy place somewhere reading a book. Um, no, they are put somewhere, told that they are in jail. They are not charged with any, anything. They, are not, they do not see any kind of trial. They are given a six month sentence. And at the end of the six months, they could very easily be given another six month sentence and another and another and another. And there are many, many people um, living under this sort of Guantanamo-like situation in which they are in there for years, having faced no charges and no trial, because that's what the only democracy in the Middle East looks like. By contrast, Israel encourages Jews from anywhere in the world to move into the West Bank and settle in these territories. And I, I, I want to go on um, to move past some of the section about what apartheid looks like, but just to be absolutely clear, electricity and water, the Palestinians have no control over their municipal services like water and electricity. Israel controls the grid all of the Jordan River and 87% of Palestinian groundwater is diverted to serve Jewish Israelis in um, Israel proper as well as in the set settlements. In addition, Israel prevents the construction of any new water infrastructure, um, new well cisterns, etc. Um, just to give you some example, not only do Palestinians pay uh, upwards of 20%, uh, 20 times more for water than Jewish settlers, but are restricted to anywhere between 10 and 60 liters a day. According to the World Health organization, a human being requires 100 liters a day, um, certainly living in a desert climate. Um, and by contrast, Jewish settlers have 400, 300, 400 um, liters a day. Um, the income and unemployment, you know, uh, negligible uh, and unemployment through the roof. In terms of education, there is not a single Arabic language university in Israel, despite Palestinians making up 20% of the Israeli population. Um, such to give you, we, we always talk about the disparities between uh, funding for education in the poorest neighborhoods in the United States and some of the more wealthy neighborhoods. Well, take a look at this. The state financing of schools is so dramatically different that according to the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, Israel spends $1,100 a year per Jewish student and 191 um, for each Palestinian. That's six times less. It's even more grossly disparate in the West Bank where Jewish children of settlers again, illegal set settlements in the eyes of the international community, get an education valued at $1,500 per child, whereas Palestinians, um, they pay a sum total of $60. 
Um, and of course, naturally, when the bombing campaigns are going on um, uh, while you're running in terror from your life, the schools are closed and you have an entire generation of Palestinian children who are largely growing up with intermittent at best or no education, formal education whatsoever. And one could go on and on and on. I want to go into the, you know, about the, the food apartheid, um, about the health apartheid, and every measure of life you have complete and total um, segregation, separation, inequality, and um, dehumanizing circumstances. I'm going to breeze quite quickly through the, um, the point about South Africa, the differences, because I want to move on to what is driving some of this. Because I do think we have to note that there is a significant difference. There is one basic significant difference between the way um, South African apartheid operated and the way um, Israeli apartheid operated it. And, and the way I, I, I think it was um, uh, Moshe Machover put it, who's one of the founding members of the Israeli socialist organization known by its newspaper's name Mats Pen, which existed in the 1960s and 70s. Um, most of them have been basically driven out. He lives in London now as a mathematician. Um, he argued that the two forms of apartheid were, belonged to the same genus, but were of a different species. In other words, in most colonial settler states, which is essentially what we must understand Israel to be, um, you go in to exploit the labor and take the resources. In Israel, the point was to get rid of any competing labor force and simply um, drive out the indigenous population, take over and, and run the place for yourself and not exploit the labor but simply eliminate um, the uh, Palestinian labor completely. So in that sense, um, the, the, the complete removal of Palestinians from having any sort of the social power that a workforce would have necessitates even greater degrees of not only solidarity throughout the Arab world with the struggle of Palestinians, but throughout the world generally. The role of solidarity activists, the role in particular of working classes in the Arab world of fighting um, for a different kind of society as well as for justice for the Palestinians is so central to the demand. You, if you don't have social power, if you don't have economic power, if you simply can't shut the system down in order to show your, your, your strength, your collectivity, um, that is a rather uh, weakened position to be in. And it's somewhat extraordinary, extraordinary to imagine the level of bravery and defiance that Palestinians have nonetheless and have continued to fight rather valiantly um, for all of these decades. I want to move on to what it is. What does, why does Israel need apartheid? What accounts for such vicious levels of hatred against Palestinians? Um, after all, Israel is the last apartheid state in the world. Why? Um, I think for the best insight into this reality, we should go um, to the man who has framed the questions um, for the last decades um, better than probably anyone, and that is the Palestinian um, writer, activist, uh, cultural critic, um, Edward Said, who died a few years ago, who was a professor at Columbia. Um, this is the book I read that changed my life at the age of 18. Um, when I met the ISO and came, had come back from Israel, had gone there as Zionist, and I came back profoundly confused and really um, quite saddened by what I saw, but not understanding it. And it was this chapter that really struck me more than any, and I'm going to quote a little bit from what he writes. It's, it's called Zionism from the standpoint of its victims, because the politics of it, the, polit the politics right, right through it is such a, a Marxist framework, historical materialist framework from which to conceive um, the history and the current um, situation of the Palestinians in Israel. And uh, this was initially written in 1979. For although it coincided with an era of the most virulent Western anti-Semitism, Zionism also coincided with the period of unparalleled European territorial acquisition in Africa and Asia. And it was as part of this general movement of acquisition and occupation that Zionism was launched initially by Theodor Herzl. And it is important to remember that in joining the general Western enthusiasm for overseas territorial acquisition, Zionism never spoke of itself unambiguously as a Jewish liberation movement, but rather as a Jewish movement for colonial settlement in the Orient. By this he means, um, for the sake of this discussion, the Middle East. The fact that no sizable segment of the Israeli population has as yet been able to confront the terrible social and political injustice done the native Palestinians is an indication of how deeply ingrained are the, by now, anomalous imperialist perspectives basic 
to Zionism, its view of the world, its sense of an inferior native or other. He goes on to write, imperialism was the theory, colonialism, the practice of changing the useless, he's being facetious here, the useless unoccupied territories of the world into useful new versions of the European metropolitan society. Everything in those territories that suggested waste, disorder, uncounted resources was to be converted into productivity, order, taxable, potentially developed wealth. You get rid of the most offending human and animal blight, whether because it simply sprawls untidily all over the place or because it roams around unproductively and uncounted, and you combine the rest to reservations, compounds, native homelands where you can count tax, use them profitably, and you build a new society on the vacated place. He quotes some of the early Zionists just to give you a flavor of the racism at its heart and from the beginning. Here's Sir Flinders Petrie. The Arab has a vast balance of romance put to his credit very needlessly. He is as disgustingly incapable as most other savages and no more worth romancing about than Red Indians or Maoris. Maoris are the indigenous population of New Zealand. I shall be glad to return to the comparatively shrewd and sensible Egyptians. Um, he moves on to say, uh, you know, and just more of these endless quotes, but I'll, I'll, I'll end with this one and, and, and move on. But the dehumanization of the Arab, which began with the view that Palestinians were either not there or savages, or both, saturates everything in Israeli society. It was not thought too unusual during the 1973 war for the army to issue a booklet written by the Central Command's rabbi, Avraham Avidan, containing the following key passage. When our forces encounter civilians during the war in the course of a pursuit or a raid, the encountered civilians may, and by halachic standards, even must be killed. Whenever it cannot be ascertained that they are incapable of hitting us back, under no circumstances should an Arab be trusted, even if he gives the impression of being civilized. Now, unless you think that is something of the past, after all, it was some decades ago, here is from the army's central command rabbi, um, excuse me, here is from the, the, the Sephardic, leading Sephardic rabbi in a letter to, uh, uh, to President Omer during the 2009 uh, rocket attacks on Gaza. There is absolutely no moral prohibition against the indiscriminate killing of civilians during a potential massive military offensive in Gaza aimed at stopping the rocket launchings. That was in the Jerusalem Post. Um, and this was, of course, not a war. It was a massacre of 1,400 Palestinians. 13 Israelis died. Nine of them were soldiers, three of them by friendly fire. This rabbi's son wrote the following. Another rabbi, by the way. If they don't stop after we kill 100, then we must kill 1,000. Then we must kill 10,000. And if they still don't stop, we must kill 100,000, even 1 million. Whatever it takes to make them stop. This man, Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu, who called for the killing of a million Palestinians, on Tuesday, he was made the head of the Israeli Red Cross. I think about this, and I think about a speech that Martin Luther King gave back in 1967 to the leadership of the Southern Christian Leadership Council, he, he, he gives a speech in which he uses a word that has stuck in my head for years, and I, I was reminded of it recently at a meeting. He said, a nation that will keep people in slavery for 244 years will thingify them, make them things. Therefore, they will exploit them, and poor people generally, economically. And a nation that will exploit economically will have foreign investments in everything else, and will have to use its military to protect them. All of these problems are tied together. The thingification of people. This is the pathological racism conditioned by life as colonial settlers in a theocratic police state run by a military junta. That is the logic of a colonial settler state. Zionist colonialism inhabits, I think, Tikva Honig Parnas, who was also part of this Mott's Pen group, who still lives in Israel to this day, who in fact started out as a Zionist, who in fact was a machine gunner um, for the Zionists in 1948, has spent much of her life as a revolutionary socialist, countering um, the narrative that she bought into as a young woman. 
And she describes it this way. She said, Zionist colonialism inhabits the space between two extinct models, those provided by South Africa and by French practice in Algeria. It is not a blend of the two, but rather a distillation of the worst in each. And really, what we've seen over the last decade in Israel is an escalation, a ratcheting up of the kinds of racist measures, I mean, the anti-miscegenation laws, the, 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 the idea now that Jews and Arabs can't marry, the idea that Arabs cannot marry and live with someone in Israel or where they live. You know, they do, they want you out. They want them out. They want them to go, not marry and, you know, and live with each other and raise families and continue to live a normal life. I think the, 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 the Tikva's line that Israel is not a country with an army, but rather an army with a state, could not be more on target. While other settler colonial states ended the colonization process once they'd taken over the territory and subdued the indigenous populations in the US, for example. But Israel is unique. They've never stopped the colonization process. It has never ended in Israel. It continues to this day. That's what the settlements are. It's a continuation of colonization process. The, the racism, the apartheid is needed because the colonization is still underway. It is still going on. It is not something of the past. It is something that is ongoing. And so that's what explains or begins to give you insight into how you can have City councilmen in Ashkelon last year leading rallies against Arabs and Jews dating each other. Or um, in Petah Tikva, if you arrived at O'Hare, you saw a flag showing that the city of Chicago is the sister city to Petah Tikva. Um, they, uh, there's a task force that was set up to patrol the city at night to break up Arab and Jewish dates. I'm not saying that there are that many, but that, that they made this the, 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 the end all and be all of their, of their existence. And in a recent poll of Israelis, you, it shows that more than half of Israeli sh Jews say that marriage to an Arab is equal to national treason. 78% of Jewish Israelis oppose Arabs joining the government. 62% support encouraging Palestinians to emigrate. 36% of Israeli Jews support revoking the voting rights of non-Jews, who, by the way, can't even vote for the parties that they want to because they simply make those parties illegal unless they agree to virtually everything that the state of Israel is about. So this idea that, well, you can vote. Well, you can vote for whom? I mean, it's sort of like what the, the military just did in Egypt. You know, the popular vote in the first round of the election went for people who were seculars, revolutionaries. Ah, they're not allowed to run in the second round of the election. This is your choice now. Same thing, same thing. This is what you have to deal in Israel. And so really what we have to understand is Israel's apartheid is a necessary function of its theocratic colonial settler status. You cannot have a democratic theocracy. Because what you wind up with is, it, is it, you know, it could be either Jewish or democratic. Because for the Jews, it's democratic. But for the Arabs, it's Jewish. So each one gets something out of it, but nobody gets both. I'm really, you know, with Tariq Ali, the Pakistani British uh, revolutionary, when he says that Palestinians have ultimately become the victims of the Nazi Holocaust as well. That the victims of one uh, uh, crude annihilation, genocide, dispossession, occupation have become the perpetrators of yet another. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a revolutionary socialist. And I, 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 don't, I, I can't plumb the depths of, of all of that and I don't think it's particularly helpful from a political standpoint for us to go into the sort of psychosis that drives some of this. But we do need to understand that as a colonizing project, is, which is what Israel is, so long as it exists as a Jewish state, it will continue the policies to the Palestinian people that is not only apartheid, but brutally inhuman. And I totally am with Paulo Freire, the radical educator who said that to wash one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless is not to be neutral. It is to side with the powerful. We, as socialists, are on the side of the powerless. We are on the side of the oppressed, and we are unequivocally on the side of the Palestinians. Israel is an apartheid state, and we throw ourselves wholeheartedly into the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, because that is the best chance we have in the current period of undoing this madness.